Right on. All right, today we have a very awesome, exciting lecture uh, ocean, um, and a moderated QA. So we're, the format's going to be a little different. He's going to present uh, some information uh, via slides, and then we're going to join us for a moderated QA. I understand a lot of folks came to class with questions. Uh, so Ocean Quigley is a creative director and an art director, best known for his work on SimCity, Spore, and The Sims at Electronic Arts. Ocean Quigley is now a creative director at Facebook, working on upcoming VR projects. Ocean has been a frequent presenter at the Game Developers Conference. Outside game development, Ocean is a traditional realist painter, and his artwork has toured the world as part of the Game On exhibit arranged by the Barbican Gallery. I'd also like to add here that he's a rare breed of developer with deep talents in both tech and visual artistry, and I've had the pleasure of working with him on several projects where his ability to combine tech and art has led to a huge impact on teams. Please join me in welcoming Ocean. Hello. This is actually kind of a bigger venue than I was expecting. I was thinking maybe five or six people uh, sitting in front of seats. Um, so um, uh, as Matthew said, uh, I'm uh, an art director and a creative director. Uh, I was at uh, Maxis, uh, makers of The Sims and some City and Spore for almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, for the last couple of years, I've been at Facebook doing um, creative director stuff with their uh, sort of internal VR projects. Um, so I'm just going to give you kind of a little tour of some of the stuff that I've been working on. Matthew had a few explicit asks, uh, which I'll try and hit. Um, and then we're going to just talk about stuff because I didn't have time to do a full like hour presentation. So this is going to be a little bit impressionistic, uh, just stuff that I happen to have in old folders. Um, and uh, so as Matthew said, I'm a traditional oil painter by training. Uh, I went to Parsons School of Design uh, and uh, for a number of years just, just worked as an oil painter. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about oil painting is it kind of had its, its glory days in the 17th century. Uh, and uh, um, as wonderful a medium as it is, um, I had the sense that, uh, that the really um, meaningful media, the exciting media of my generation was all in games and interactivity. Uh, so um, even though I love oil painting and continue to paint and have a gallery that shows my work and so forth, um, uh, I decided that uh, I, I was never going to equal Rembrandt, nor was I in Rembrandt's time. Um, so it made a lot more sense to try and um, do stuff in the modern era. So um, let's see. I'll start with some of the um, SimCity stuff. Uh, so um, I was the art director on SimCity 3000, which um, came out before most of you were born. Um, let's see. I, I was a, a, a production artist on SimCity 2000. Uh, uh, well, specifically on the Sega Genesis port of SimCity 2000, um, and uh, uh, art director and creative director on SimCity 4, and on the most recent SimCity, which was very pretty but had a troubled launch. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, some of the images from that and talk a little bit about uh, the mechanics of it. Um, as, a, as an art director uh, and a creative director in um, projects like this, uh, where you're not just sort of fleshing out uh, level design, you're, you're, you're trying to figure out um, the sort of the deep visual mechanics, the, the symbolic vocabulary of the world, uh, and how that symbolic vocabulary of the world is represented to the player, um, it, it necessitates kind of a, both a deep understanding of the game mechanics that you're trying to represent and of the technical sort of constraints that you've got available. So I'm just going to play a couple of these videos just to have stuff to talk about. Um, let's see. So actually, this is mirrored. I can look at both. So um, for uh, the most recent SimCity, I was really inspired by tilt-shift photography uh, and the sort of miniaturization that you get uh, in, um, in that effect. I know you've probably seen it. It was a fad 10 years ago, five years ago, where people would take landscape photographs and then blur them to make them look like they were miniatures. Uh, and, uh, and so I decided to try and make SimCity evoke that sensibility. Um, and then on top of that, uh, this um, uh, well, this is an example. I'm going to jump right into the deep end. I told you this was going to be an impressionistic talk, and now I'm just going to jump all around. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, one of the interesting things about simulation games or games like SimCity is you have all these things in the world that are supposed to look like buildings or cars or trees, but what they really are is they're really user interface. They're really telling you as a, as a player what's going on in the simulation, and they're telling you um, what you can do about it. Uh, and so all the creative decisions um, start with what's the functional requirement of, uh, of a given piece of art. You know, what, what, what job is it doing um, 
uh, in connecting the mechanics of the game to the player in a way that they can understand. So, um, so in this case, uh, we've got like lights. The lights tell you this thing is active and powered. You've got smoke coming out. The amount of smoke coming out is a function of how much coal it's consuming. Uh, if the thing goes dead, you see all the lights go out and you see uh, kind of electrical sparks. How much coal you've got in there is a, uh, actually a meaningful gameplay simulation element, uh, et cetera. So um, one of the kind of the first things that you have to understand doing art direction or even creative direction for games is that all your decisions have to be motivated. Um, it's not enough to say, oh, that looks awesome. I'm going to stick it in there. I mean, that is pretty good. Um, but it's, it's, it's more important or deeper or more fundamental to understand well, why? What, what, what's what's the, the thing that you're trying to represent with a given piece of art? What, what job is it doing and how does it further that? Um, then there's just a bunch of stuff. Actually, I'll show you this one first. Then there's just a bunch of stuff that's kind of magical that you can do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about shaders uh, in a moment. So this is just a flat quad. Um, uh, this is just a flat quad with textures on it, but a very clever shader that makes the textures look like they're uh, recessive, like, like they're rooms going in with depth. So um, so there's no, there's no actual depth there. I mean, it's all computer graphics. There's no depth anywhere. But, uh, but this is just a, um, a clever shader trick. And it's one of the things that we did um, in SimCity to give you the illusion that you're looking at into volumes of buildings. You know, you're looking through windows um, into, uh, into interiors where there's sort of life. And uh, we could basically have some of those windows have lights on, telling you what percentage of the, room, of the building is inhabited. Or if it's powered, we could even have some of those buildings be on fire. Um, then, uh, then here's what it looks like. Um, let's see if I can. If I'm so here's what it looks like with uh, with a building facade stuck on top of it. So those are the same simple flat quads um, uh, underneath uh, building geometry. Uh, the building geometry is all faked as well. That's all displacement maps uh, and relief maps uh, in a shader too. Um, and here I'm just stripping away the exterior geometry so you can see underneath the uh, all the, the interior map tricks um, where stuff is occluded. Where stuff is occluded by geometry, you can get away with, uh, with terrible UV artifacts and nobody's ever going to know. Um, here's uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting, uh, and I encourage this sort of attitude, uh, especially in the people that I work with, is once you've got some trick that you've got available, like, hey, interior mapping, well, you can apply it everywhere. Like, uh, you look for uh, multiple, if, so if you're going to basically harass some engineer into making some feature for you, then you want to figure out how, how uh, universal how universally can that feature be applied? So uh, my lead graphics engineer gave me this interior mapping technique. Um, and so I realized, heck, I could apply that to like car interiors. And so this is just on the, the car over there uh, has got, um, it's just, just an interior map. Like there's no actual interior geometry there. But it gives you this illusion of looking into a little matchbox car, you know, with, uh, with uh, an inside volume. And it's the exact same geometry as the, um, as the shiny opaque car over here. Um, on the, on the right, or on the left, I guess. But you can see um, how much richer these parallaxy tricks are. So one of the things that you want to do is like, um, uh, be opportunistic. You know, uh, jump around and look for interesting applications of uh, stuff that you've got. Um, let's see, one of the other techniques that we, well, one of the things we wanted to do with SimCity um, uh, was give you, and I, I gotta get a move on, I know, here, um, is uh, give you the, let's see if this will actually load. After all that, oh, here we go. Was um, we wanted to render a million trees, for example, uh, and have those trees be lit and in the round, so that you could spin around them. Let's see if this will actually play. Come on. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so here is a forest with, you know, literally a million trees in it. Um, and so as a, as a sort of a technical art director, technical graphic designer, one of the things you try and do is figure like, how on earth am I going to do this? You know, like. Uh, there's no way we can render the geometry for a million trees, let alone light them, uh, have them be dynamic, have the, the leaves change color, and so forth. And so we came up with this um, technique called um, that, uh, that's broadly spe speaking in a, in a category called imposters or impostering, where we rendered out um, this sprite sheet, uh, a sprite sheet much like this one, for example, um, uh, a sprite sheet that's rendered out per frame. Uh, so that we can counter-rotate as the camera moves. So when the camera goes up, you can look down on them. When the camera goes down, you can look up at them. So you can basically pivot these little people in their little frames. Um, uh, you can um, project all those little sprites onto cards. And so you pay a fixed cost 
of rendering this buffer texture, basically. But then you can project that buffer texture onto a million people walking down the streets. And the colors are crazy here because we, we're doing old school um, color remapping, uh, pal palletizing, uh, um, where you uh, actually, I've really shown my age here. Nobody palletizes anything anymore. Um, where you use a, a color palette to give the, uh, um, to give a huge amount of color variation from a, a small set of assets. So here's what these guys look like. Come on, baby. When they are all palletized. Sorry, I hadn't realized these things were going to take so long to load. There we go. So uh, random color generation. Um, and as you can see, as the camera moves, um, we are counter-rotating the little people. And you wind up with um, the illusion of, uh, of actually little people there. And I'll show you one more of this before, uh, before actually, I'll show you a couple more things here before moving on from SimCity. So the thing that that enables, of course, is a whole lot of people, um, like millions and millions and millions of people, uh, um, especially if you're Essentially, each person is like a little GPU particle, so you can render a whole lot of them. Um, and, uh, and these are all, as you can see, palletized. Um, we also uh, used, it's kind of fun to keep up with um, graphics tech. Um, uh, maybe about five or six years ago, um, maybe more than that, um, uh, Valve came up with this technique called sign distance fields, uh, where you can get really crisp, sharp graphics from tiny, tiny little low resolution textures. Um, and so we took that approach and then all this palletization to give you um, a world of uh, detailed little signage all over your city um, from tiny little 32 by 32 pixel textures, or in some cases even smaller than that. Um, so I encourage you to, um, to occasionally look at like CGraph graphics proceedings. Um, there's all kinds of good techniques uh, in there that you can apply, especially um, if you're interested in um, shading and shader math and the render pipeline. Um, let's see. There's more stuff here, we can go into it later if need be. I, I have other things to show as well. Um, one of the other things that you can do as a, as a sort of visual designer or visual creator director is um, build visual prototypes of systems before you ask somebody to implement them or even before you implement them. So for uh, like SimCity 4, we had this whole road system where the player would sort of drag roads over the landscape and it would sort of magically create roads. And um, designing that system was like taking a five month long IQ test. Um, where we had to figure out all the permutations of, of giant libraries of tiles. Like this is one set of intersections where, um, where you've got, um, you've got like a, a basically a four by four or even bigger five by five array of tiles uh, that's the, the, the maximal intersection. And you have to figure out all the possible permutations of tiles that would allow somebody to, to drag those and write a solver for that uh, and then make it all seem kind of magical and automatic and no big deal. So these were a bunch of um, visualizations that I did just trying to figure out, oh, and then the same thing for railroads. Um, this is like where I have a, at the time I had like a three-year-old, he's not three years old anymore, but I had a three-year-old and uh, he had a Brio train set and I was like, this is inspiration. Um, uh, but it turns out even Brios aren't abstract enough. You've got to go further from there. I won't go into a whole amount of detail here, but, um, but one of the things as, a, as an art director or creative director I try and do is find engineers that are motivated to solve particularly interesting problems and then collaborate with them on the visual side, build representations for them, uh, and try and get in front of them uh, uh, and lay out some design. Um, because I, I've discovered that given all the wonderful tools that, uh, that artists have at their disposal, tools like Maya and Modo and um, oh, scripting tools and shader writing tools, that if you can't prototype it in Modo or Maya, then uh, there's no way on earth that anybody else can implement it. Um, I was also the um, art director and creative director on Spore, which consumed a big chunk of my 30s. Um, but Spore was a game where, um, well, actually, the game wasn't uh, much, but the, uh, um, but the creative parts of it were really wonderful. Um, that was a game where we gave people tools to create all kinds of wonky monster creatures uh, and automatically um, create a skeletal system underneath them so that they could animate and then procedurally animate them and then procedurally UV them so that you could be texture them, and then procedurally texture them as well. So, um, so people made, I mean, at this point, hundreds of millions of, uh, of creatures. Uh, and in fact, um, we shipped the game, uh, and the first, I don't know, three weeks, we were flooded with hundreds of thousands of examples of uh, the pornography that 14-year-olds can imagine uh, once, they, uh, once they get their hands on these tools. Um, it was actually startling, because we thought, we thought, let's, 
what's the worst that could happen? And we kind of like made our feeble attempts at mocking up the worst that could happen. And then we released it to the internet. And it turns out that the internet's imagination about the worst that could happen is just orders of magnitude beyond the, the worst <laughs> that, that you could imagine. Um, Spore was fun because um, it was fully a procedural game. Um, uh, in most games, as an art director, you kind of figure out, okay, what are we trying to represent? Um, what kind of budget do we have to do it? What's our visual style? Uh, and then, um, as an art director, you work with the artists uh, to make it. You know, you make it look like that. No, not like that. Like this. You know, and you kind of work with them day in, day out. You have reviews. Uh, uh, you show the art to all the stakeholders. You make sure everybody agrees. You go back. You fix things. Um, and it's pretty much like you make it. It shows up on screen. Um, with uh, with the games that I'm describing, games like The Sims, Spore, and SimCity, it's much more. Those are much more games about making procedural systems. So instead of art directing artists, you're art directing engineers to indirectly art direct the players. <laughs> Um, so it's sort of art directing on stilts because you're art directing engineers, but then the engineers are on stilts as well. So it's, it's multiple degrees of indirection before you actually get to the stuff that appears on screen. Um, but that's pretty wonderful because uh, the upshot of it is is that you amplify people's creativity. You know, they do simple small things and they wind up with these elaborate um, worlds that result. And then if you um, play through the game, uh, and again, I'm not making many apologies for the game. The game wasn't great, but um, but, uh, for example, you have these planets, and you can tear from the planets, and so a single planet can go through all these different states. You know, like, is it too hot, or is it too cold, is it too wet, or is it too dry, and so forth. So, um, yeah, Spore was a fun project. Um, it just took too long. Um, let's see, and uh, Matthew also asked me to briefly touch on um, uh, shader stuff, uh, because he, he mentioned that a lot of you guys are making Unity games, and you're not necessarily artists and you're pulling down content from the Unity Asset Store, and it's kind of a dog's breakfast of miscellaneous junk that you're trying to pull together into some coherent aesthetic, right? Um, and uh, ideally, you'd have um, artists that you'd work with that would make stuff look good. But barring that, one technique that you can do is um, just hammer it with a real distinct look that you can write shaders for, and then slather post-processing effects over the whole thing so as to sort of spackle together all these discrete elements that otherwise um, don't um, really cohere. And you'd be um, kind of amazed. I mean, part of the trick is um, coming up with a visual style, right? Like rummaging around in books, rummaging in magazines, finding example art styles that you want to emulate. But you'd be amazed at how expressive you can be with these things. So here, for example, is like a, um, some spheres and some fat dudes and some elephants. Um, but um, let's see if I'm going to go the right direction. Nope, wrong direction. Um, but uh, um, you can apply shader tricks to make them look like they're cardboard cutouts if you want to, right? I mean, so you can apply um, huge transformations uh, that, um, that take ordinary content. So I'm just, just for example's sake, and I'll pop open a scene in a second. Um, here's like the same assets um, being rendered, um, you know, with like a lino cut style. So you could imagine um, game, a game that would look like, um, you know, an old timey illustration, or I was playing around with, um, uh, a shader to give you the look of like a, a, an old lithograph. Um, these are, this was when I was in kind of a, a non-photorealistic kick, just trying to figure out how to emulate old uh, media of various sorts. There's a ton of these things on my, um, on my blog. Um, this was uh, kind of like a Dr. Susi watercolor style. Dr. Susi, no, uh, Babar watercolor style. Um, here's kind of like a grainy, uh, um, let's see, that's a little bit, um, uh, like a mesotint kind of look. Um, and then um, you can also, um, actually, I'll, I'll just show you a quick shader here. Um, how many of you guys have played with Shader Forge? I know all, you're all using Unity, right? Because, um, uh, um, so to get really good at shaders, um, ideally, you would take a couple um, YouTube tutorials on them and practice for a bunch. But to get like halfway decent um, with very little skill, uh, there's this wonderful, um, plugin uh, called Shader Forge. I think it's like 90 bucks or 60 bucks or somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so that lets you take relatively crappy assets that don't look like much of anything um, and stylize them to look at least visually distinct and interesting. And the thing that's cool about that is that you can apply the same shader or the same set of shaders to a whole bunch of disparate content. And um, the consequence is everything is sort of glued together. Everything looks like it belongs in the same world. I'm just going to give you a quick look at Shader Forge because um, it is probably as a, as a, for a, uh, a technical artist doing visual prototyping, it is the cat's pajamas. I mean, it's just, you can make stuff in no time at all that is kind of cool. Um, 
So uh, let's see, let's just drag a, so here's a particularly unimpressive shader. Um, and in fact, it's particularly unimpressive because it is uh, not, uh, let's just recompile that. Um, so here's a particularly unimpressive shader. So you can just, I'm just gonna spend 20 seconds, I promise. I'm not gonna bore you all to death with uh, um, shader tutorials. But, um, but you can say, for example, just grab me the light direction and grab me the surface normal. Uh, and then just give me a dot product between the two of them. And just glue those together, right? So like, yes, you have to have some rough idea of the math underneath, but nothing kind of sophisticated. Okay, compile that, and that's that. And then say, okay, let's just go ahead and do a, um, I don't know, a threshold, for example. Or posterize, sure. So I'll drag that in there and drop in a, uh, Posterize it into four steps and wire that in. And now it's posterized and so forth. So as, so you guys are probably all just using the Unity standard shader for all your stuff. Um, and the Unity standard shader is great. I mean, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, I mean, it's astoundingly powerful. The PBR stuff is great, especially used in conjunction with like modern texturing workflows like um, Substance Painter, Substance Designer, or 3D Coat. Um, but the problem is, is all your stuff winds up looking the same. Uh, and if you, uh, um, if you take the time to write custom shaders that are specific for your game, and write is an overstatement, like just drag together, glue together, um, then uh, you can make a style uh, that is unique to yours. I mean, it's basically, it's, it's, it's your own stuff. So um, uh, I'm happy to share this Unity project. I can't actually share the Shader Forge asset because that would be pirating, but, um, but uh, I'll give you guys the rest of it. Um, so yeah, these are a bunch of like hacky subsurface scattering stuff. Uh, um, kind of uh, illustrative style, vertex color, uh, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's more, but I could go on, and I know we want to move on to the um, conversation part of it. So, okay, that's that. Just while we're in the intermission, I would say um, pretty, pr pretty amazing what you could do with shaders. I think there's a broader paradigm here, which is that in game development, if you are really strong at one skill, there's often an opportunity to fill in a deficit in other skills. So you might be someone who's really technical, has a lot of experience programming, um, feels comfortable with the shaders, but really can't create their own art. And this is, uh, especially with the elephants, the example there, uh, there's so much you could do to kind of emulate that. And um, I hope that was a useful example for kind of the use case where you might have a lot of different motley assets from the asset store. How can you effectively you know, uh, find a cohesive visual for that? So um, r really insightful stuff. Um, so I understand some folks in the audience have questions, but I'll uh, proceed with a few. Um, I'm interested, Ocean, you've worked on some really big teams, but you've also worked on smaller indie games. How is the dynamic or the way you approach game design um, and creative direction different when you're on a much larger team versus a smaller team? So um, on uh, the, the major difference is on a, on a project that is going to have a big team, you're answerable to a lot more people, right? Like that's the, kind of the first, the first thing. But in practice, um, they all start the same, right? Like most games start with a person or a couple of people having a clever idea and bagging out some prototypes, uh, putting them in front of people, getting some feedback from those people, rolling them into another prototype um, until uh, they have something that catches fire or doesn't, right? Um, and in the case of like working on uh, big projects at EA, they all start as little projects at EA. Like even The Sims started as like three or four of us just trying to figure out some dollhouse stuff, right? And, uh, and it's only um, kind of the victory condition where you get like, we love your stuff and we want to throw lots of money at you and, uh, and here's 200 people. Um, and in fact, that can be a, a total calamity too um, because games, like any project really of any um, complexity has a normal organic growth pattern. You know, you start out with a small thing, get it functioning, then make it a somewhat larger functioning thing, and then a somewhat larger functioning thing, taking care never to make it not a functioning thing um, as you get more and more people. Um, and uh, the culture of your team, the, the, um, the relationship between the people who are working on it and the, the shared vision of it, uh, especially on big projects, um, is the difference between success and failure, right? Like if everybody's pulling in different directions, um, good luck, you, you, just, you might go find another job. Um, and so I've been on projects at EA, uh, um, like the most recent SimCity is a good example, where um, there were like three of us and we were making this thing and then there were like eight of us and we were making this thing and then 15 of us were making this thing and it was 
turned out to be kind of a beautiful thing, and EA uh, had this kind of, we love you so much, we're going to hug you to death, um, and, uh, and uh, dumped 120 people on us. And so that's kind of like diluting the initial team you know, by a factor of 10. Um, and so that um, is really hard. So, so scaling and managing this sort of the scale of the project and who's on the project um, is, uh, um, is more a factor with giant projects, but, but they all start out as small visions that iterate into larger visions. So students in uh, CS146 are working on uh, pretty small teams, maybe two to four as an average size. Um, but some folks might publish their game and then decide they want to continue on work with it. Um, they might be interested in adding some friends to the project. When is the appropriate time to scale, and when have you found in the projects you've worked on was the right time to add more people to the team? So um, the right time is when you have explicit things that need to be done that are more than you can do. Uh, so unless, unless you really love somebody, unless you really love somebody, don't just bring them on because you love them. I mean, for the most part, uh, you have uh, um, some vision that you're building, you're building it, uh, and it grows to be larger than you can um, do yourself, and so you bring somebody else on and rinse, wash, repeat. That's kind of all there is to it. And so on pretty much all the projects that have been on that have been successful, um, we've brought more people on them uh, as the project demanded it, uh, not because of external, not because we got funding, for example, or not, not because of external reasons. Um, and with anything that's ambitious, there's usually a lot of stuff that needs to be done and uh, stuff that you're not competent to do. Uh, and so it's pretty obvious. Like you're, you're, you're often, on a project saying, I wish I had a rendering engineer, or I wish I had somebody who could just deal with this pathfinding for me, or whatever it might be. And so usually the, the wants are out there before the, the people arrive. Right on. Um, so let's take some questions from the audience. Who has a question for Ocean? Right. How do you go about that? Is that normally come from you when you're trying it out, or do you get that from other people? I'll have to repeat the question. Um, <laughs> so the, the question is, how do you find an artistic style for your game? Um, boy, there's lots of ways. Uh, the, um, uh, at root, you try and figure out what the, um, the deeper um, design requirements are. Like, what, what job is the art doing? You know, in the case of Spore, um, we knew that, uh, that there were technical constraints, like our animations, these procedural animation systems that, uh, that uh, attempt to generalize animations across arbitrary bone topologies um, look really stupid when you start putting them onto things that look super realistic. You know, the animation's all wobbly and jello-y, and, uh, um, and so uh, we uh, did some experiments with like more sort of ZBrushy style detailed characters with detailed elements, uh, and then we animated them, and we're like, oh, oh no. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, creepy. Um, and, uh, and so we dialed back the visual fidelity to hit the animation fidelity. Um, I mean, that is kind of the essence of the Uncanny Valley, right? Uh, so if you have visual fidelity, um, if you have soup, every pore is modeled, and the skin sheen is perfect, and, and, all, and then the, the thing moves like a robot, it's just, it's just terrible, right? So you always want to have your behavioral and your, your animation fidelity. Um, higher than your visual fidelity. So in the case of Spore, our animation fidelity was really quite low, uh, and so that, that resulted in us pushing the, um, the aesthetic down to um, a level where we could move the things and they'd be like adorable instead of, uh, instead of uh, creepy. Um, there's also lots of stakeholders around things. Like one of the things that was interesting about working on The Sims, so in Spore people thought like, well, I kind of like it or I don't like it or whatever, but in The Sims, um, when we were modeling, you know, like chairs and, and uh, bathroom sets and stuff like that. Um, so most people don't consider themselves to be experts on how weird alien monsters look and move, but everybody's an expert on how bathrooms look. Uh, and so you wind up with um, way more um, uh, solicited or unsolicited feedback uh, with things that people fam feel familiar with. Um, so with uh, like The Sims, we went with a style that was um, kind of deliberately evocative of mid-century sitcoms, you know, like, uh, uh, leave it to Beaver, stuff like that, uh, because we wanted to evoke um, sort of uh, an abstract simplification of suburban life, right? And that's, that's kind of what those are. Um, and we didn't want to sort of overlay um, a particularly um, intense style over everything. 
because uh, ultimately these are people's domestic fantasies about things, and if it looks all kind of like film noir, then, um, then you've kind of got a problem. Uh, in the case of SimCity, uh, like I said, the style was inspired by, um, by model railroads and tilt shift photography that attempts to make the real world look like model railroad photographs. So, um, so every project starts, every art style starts with trying to internalize the, um, the goals and the constraints and the requirements uh, of the project and then uh, trying to satisfy those on, on bigger projects, especially projects at EA where you're beholden to a corporate hierarchy above you. Um, you have to do a compelling job of selling the vision, the, the, the visual style that you want. You know, it's not just a matter of declaring, uh, I have found it and you will all stand in line. Um, instead, it's like uh, a, more of a seduction. You know, like here's a beautiful style, um, you can see why you want it, here's the job it's doing, um, and then um, gathering feedback. And that was actually one of the secrets of my creative success uh, is um, I, I don't have a huge amount of ego over the things that I create. Uh, and so I would come up with visuals of some something, the visual style of the game, for example, and I'd show it to people, and other people who are smarter than me would have good ideas, uh, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, rebuff them because uh, of uh, sort of the ego threat. Instead, I would sort of try and cherry pick the best ideas um, and integrate them into uh, my own work, um, and then you show them back to the person who had this suggestion, and um, they think, oh my god, I love you because you're paying attention to me. Um, so they become sort of allies of yours on the project. Um, and frankly, like, depending upon where you're in the bell curve, there's lots of people smarter than you. Uh, and so you can harvest uh, better ideas than the ones you've got and roll them into um, the thing that you're creating. And even, even if you give total credit to those other people, the fact that you're the sort of the, um, the person that's combining all this stuff and putting it in front gives you the ultimate kind of oh, authorial ability to, to say what the style is. So uh, it's a long-winded answer. All right. But. Let's, uh, let's visit the next question. When ideas first occur to you and you want to jot them down, do you find yourself gravitating toward traditional media or digital media? How do you record notes? Uh, I've got um, all sorts of um, dog-eared, crappy paper notebooks. Um, and uh, some nice ones, some lousy ones. Uh, I use, uh, like, um, let's see. Initially, I would use like really precious um, wallet ink and fountain pens and stuff like that. But I found that that made me like obsess over the drawing as opposed to the idea. So now I tend to use like orange sharpies because they um, they're so deflating. Like you can't you can't get um, too precious over a drawing that you do in an orange sharpie. Um, uh, and so that lets me kind of like sketch stuff down, get the idea down, uh, and then. Um, uh, and then when you show it to people, they're like, is that, is that an orange Sharpie? And they're like, yeah, that's an orange Sharpie. So I, I bought a whole collection of like, um, like my little pony style Sharpies in a, in a, in a bin, and, uh, and I've got them for that very purpose. Right um, but, then, um, uh, but then the whole, you've got all these wonderful tools for visualizing stuff. Like if, if you haven't uh, picked up um, like 3D modeling tools, uh, they're not easy to use, but they're not impossible to use either. And they're such a force multiplier. <laughs> Um, for representing um, your ideas. Uh, you can mock up interactions in like a, a program like Maya, or I, I personally use Modo, which is a really wonderful tool. Um, you, can, uh, um, you can use them to quickly sketch together uh, uh, sort of fairly compelling, fairly com complex uh, representations of your ideas, uh, and then uh, even put them into like Unity and say walk around them or invoke them or stuff like that. So. Uh, um, all the tools at your disposal, but it usually starts with uh, pink sharpies. Right on. Do we have another question? Yeah. Have you ever had a very specific art direction in mind that you didn't think you'd be able to realize? Have you ever been able to, or have you found yeah, yourself in the situation yeah. where you couldn't realize an artistic direction you had in your mind? Um, so for, uh, so always. <laughs> um, you come up with some style and it's going to be the most amazing thing in the world, right? And then you kind of, get a first cut implementation of it and it's not very good at all. Uh, and then you, you iterate and you iterate and you iterate and you kind of bring other people on. And eventually um, you kind of have something kind of cool but it's sort of swerved away from what you wanted. Uh, and uh, so in the case of Spore, for example, I wanted to have um, procedural uh, spines and feathers and fur on the creatures. And we did a, and in fact the aesthetic was, the initial aesthetic had a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, and it turned out that just GPUs at the time weren't powerful enough. To, um, I mean, they could render it, but they, they couldn't um, 
uh, we couldn't weight all the, uh, all the fur and feathers uh, dynamically and then animate them in a compelling sort of way. Um, and so uh, everything became lizardy, even though initially it was supposed to be like furry and birdy and stuff like that. Um, I mean, the, you have uh, a vision and you try and get as close to vision as you can, but reality always intervenes. Uh, I mean, maybe less so now that the tools have gotten so good, but, uh, but in the time frame that I was doing a lot of those games, uh, we were writing our own engines from scratch, uh, and, uh, um, and the limitations are things you just have to work around, you know, find, find creative solutions against. Um, and that said, you often um, discover cool things that you didn't expect uh, as you try and implement. Uh, and, uh, and so you, you don't get the thing that you want, but you got something kind of cool that you weren't expecting as a consequence of going on the journey trying to get the thing that you want. Ocean, would you say that there's one or more uh, particular sources from which you draw your inspiration? Um, you know, there's so much wonderful stuff out there. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, on Twitter, I follow all these spectacularly wonderful game artists, uh, and I see their work, and, just, and I just despair. Uh, there's, there's just so much great stuff out there. The trick is not, um, uh, is not finding inspiration. The trick is not getting you know, drowned in inspiration. Um, I uh, sometimes try and go further afield than, than kind of like contemporary game art. Uh, uh, I'm trained, as you saw in the paintings, as a traditional oil painter, you know, so I, I've got a pretty um, big book of uh, wonderful historical artists. I, I've been looking at uh, Yoshida Hiroshi's stuff. I don't know if you know him. He's a, he's a kind of a Japanese woodblock artist of the like late 19th and early 20th century, um, who's I mean, he's one of the best artists in the whole history of the world, in my opinion, and he's not very well known. Uh, and I've been fantasizing about making a game in the style of Yoshida Hiroshi's prints, but I've, I mean, that is well beyond me. Like, I have no idea how to do that. Let's have another question, yes? So on that note, I was hoping you could comment on uh, breaking your class schedule into the more technical ones, particularly in sort of today's world. How have you bridged your classical training into uh, your current work? It's strange. There never really was a bridge. Uh, I, I mean, as a kid, I got a Commodore 64 and started programming, and I liked The Incredible Hulk, so I drew The Incredible Hulk, you know, and they were kind of like, both nerd pastimes that were pretty close to each other, you know, like in the, and, uh, and so uh, I got a better computer and uh, got better at drawing and got a better computer and got better at drawing. And so they were always braided together for me. Um, I uh, went through, in my like art school days, I went through a big um, kind of golden era of American illustration phase, like uh, people like Maxwell Parrish and N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle and really the, sort of the giants of narrative art in the early 20th century. Uh, and I, I, for a while, wanted to sort of be N.C. Wyeth, but I realized that this is just that, that the, the universe where you could be N.C. Wyeth was in 1920, and that's just not there anymore. So, uh, so there were brief sort of fantasies of going and doing some other um, thing altogether, but in, in practice, they, they're just kind of folded, folded together. And uh, I find that the traditional media, because I still I have a studio, uh, have naked models that come and pose on Thursday nights. You're all welcome to come and join us. Uh, uh, I find that the, um, that the physical media, the traditional media, is a nice ballast uh, against the digital media. Um, and so as a result, I'm actually a fairly crappy digital painter. Like I, I'm a pretty good physical painter with physical oil paints, but whenever, I mean, I got a Cintiq in the studio and stuff like that, but when I draw with it, it's like, oh God, this is not oil paint. Um, so uh, uh, it's, I also, as a kid, like built model airplanes. I mean, the full nerd panoply, right? Like D and D, model airplanes, <laughs> drew comic books, and programmed computers. Uh, and they've all they've all been um, like really important to my career in retrospect. You know, like they, it's strange that you could build a career in those things, but uh, but I did. I can keep talking. Like, so, <laughs> Ocean, you uh, you showed us the way that you used um, a shader as like a technical solution to fix let's say, very different artistic direction um, or very different art styles with the assets you were using. Right. But what do you do in the case when you have maybe multiple people on the team who feel like they want to go in different directions with the artistic direction? So it's not maybe a technical issue, but a social issue. Right. What have you found useful as a way to deal with that situation? Um, ultimately, somebody has to win, right? There's a consensus, but it has to be one thing. You know, like If it's multiple things, then you have to figure out how on earth do you make a game with clear multiple channels. Um, the, the, the lack of team alignment uh, around something as crucial as kind of the visual style is just as destructive as a lack of alignment around, um, around what the game is or what the game mechanics are. Um, if if you and your team 
um, can't come to consensus around what the game style is, then you're not a team. You, you need to go do something else. Um, the, you're just sort of, uh, you might learn some interesting tech. So uh, now how you get to consensus is an interesting question. Um, the, uh, um, usually in the projects that I've done, uh, it hasn't been whoever argues the most uh, or who has the, the, the longest tolerance for sitting in meetings. Uh, usually it's um, whoever can present mock-ups or prototypes of the most compelling vision wins. Uh, and then the ones that really win are those that cherry pick the best concepts or the best ideas from, uh, from competing visions and integrate them into their vision. Um, but ultimately there has to be a synthesis. Uh, um, or you don't have a thing. You've got a, sort of a, a pile of different things loosely bound together. Sorry, you, that was, maybe that was too harsh an answer? I don't know. That's right. <laughs> when it comes to, um, maybe you could think of one of those projects or another one you've worked on, is there anything which in retrospect you would have done differently in approaching some of these large projects you, you've played a role in? Um, so every project is its own journey, right? And at the, um, when you're done, like the, the thing that emerges as the artifact of that journey. And some of those journeys involve stumbling around in the dark, banging your shins. Um, and, uh, and that's fine. You know, you're basically like, oh, I should not do that again. Um, the, um, uh, but there haven't been, I, I guess the, the, the other times that we've messed up, and I, I've already alluded to this, were when we sort of allowed the team to grow too large, too fast, and then had a hell of a job to do to try and resolve and reconcile the competing visions about what we're making into one thing. Um, uh, but no, I'll, I have to say, even, even the projects which fizzled um, were interesting um, experiments. So I did a, an indie game project with a friend of mine for six months. I mean, no, no, not, not a huge investment, where we were trying to figure out worthwhile things to do with life simulation uh, inside a fluid sim. So like tide pools that kind of swish around and, uh, and chemical gradients and little kind of like animalcules that kind of like follow around. And, um, and that one ultimately failed because um, the, the engineer that I was working with decided he wanted to move to London, which is eight hours offset. Uh, and it was just impossible to maintain the kind of the mind meld that you need um, with your teammates when uh, they're in different continents. Um, but that was why he was going to move to London. Mm, that, was, that was that. That was the end of the project. Um, uh, other projects, uh, some of them, like so SimCity, uh, the last SimCity uh, went out the door before it was ready. Uh, before the servers were ready, before the simulation was fully tuned. Uh, and that's just like the, rea the reality of working for EA. EA's got a schedule, and stuff is going to go out when it goes out. And uh, you um, kind of like have your trajectory of where the game needs to be, and then EA's got their trajectory of when they've got their marketing spend. Uh, and uh, it's basically uh, we were unable to convince them that really they'd be much, much better off just, just three, months, three months later. They'd sell more and have a better game, and three months later, um, and that was, I mean, immovable force, uh, no, immovable object, uh, uh, unstoppable force bang into each other. And so uh, that was s stressful and unpleasant, but it's one of those things where um, if it's outside of your control, you probably shouldn't stress over it. Right now in the, the games industry, there is more creators than there's ever been before. I think um, when we look at indie games, there's um, the indie apocalypse, which some have named it. With reference to AAA games, we uh, don't have to look very far back. Lawbreakers is probably a good example. Um, and then this week, students are going to be working on trailers to make their game stand out. They're also going to be doing their demo day, students in 146, um, to present their game. I'm interested in what insights you have with respect to how students can make their game truly stand out in a market which, in, in some avenues, is, is certainly becoming oversaturated. Yeah, um, so there the answer is both obvious and impossible, right? Come up with a hook that nobody else has thought of. <laughs> like, <laughs> let me know if you do it, and I will follow you on Twitter. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, that, uh, that silly goose game that just was announced like a month ago. Who on earth would think that like, being a goose and like, harassing a gameskeeper, a groundskeeper, would be a wonderful thing? But oh my god, it's a wonderful thing. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing, uh, just historically there, is that working for EA uh, with a whole staff of people building engines, um, we, we, in retrospect, had like a 15-year grace period where um, we were the only people with 3D engines. <laughs> and so we could do all these things uh, without having to worry about um, 
uh, disruptive innovation coming up from below. Um, and then uh, Unity and Unreal came out and spoiled the whole game for us because now everybody can do amazing 3D things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a sound hook, it's a mechanics hook, it's a visual hook. Um, I mean, I suppose you could just do something familiar really, really, really wonderfully. Um, but boy, it's hard to get your head above water with that one. Um, and uh, if you think back to, or if you, I don't know what you do. If I think back to the games uh, that caught my attention over the course of the last year or so, I mean, the games like uh, Inside, for example, uh, um, uh, oof, now I'm uh, blanking. They've been games that have been quite <coughs> visually distinctive. Uh, Jonathan Blow's game, The Witness, uh, for example. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Are, um, or uh, my friend uh, Chris Hecker's game, Spy Party, which he's been admittedly working on for the last decade, um, have uh, uh, all have a um, kind of an angle on things that is actually to creativity. You know, is this something new and wonderful in, in the world? Uh, and uh, so if you are EA, you can certainly do another like Battlefield and make a ton of money. But if you're not EA, then um, you actually have to exercise creativity. Uh, and I, I don't know how to help you with that. You know, it's just, it's just part of the game. Do you have a question from the students? I, I'm personally really curious. You mentioned that like stakeholders have a, a play in deciding uh, like visual aesthetic and also like parts of the game. Certainly. I'm really curious how much their voice matters. I had not at all thought about stakeholders. So, so, so to, to what to what degree does a stakeholder have impact on the game? Um, oh, it's profound. I mean, it depends on if you're if you're at a place like EA, for example, where they're going to have to market your game. I mean, your game's going to if you're working for EA your game's gonna cost $30 million, right? Like anybody who's gonna spend $30 million is gonna have some say in what happens to that $30 million. Um, and, uh, and then they're probably gonna spend another $30 million marketing it, right? And so, um, so as soon as it's a thing that's worth presenting or talking or showing, um, you've gotta get alignment with all the, I mean, EA is a crazy place, but you've gotta get alignment with all the people who um, have to come together and pull to make it a success, right? So there's the, the first the internal sort of politics of it, like, Making sure that enough people inside EA want to do the thing, right? And then, um, then there's sort of the publishing arm. Can we actually get this in front of the people who are going to care about it? And marketing and promotions and uh, and uh, and so, uh, it's it's um, it's. I hate to say it. I'm marketing sounds pejorative, uh, but it's a uh, and seduction sounds creepy. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Some cross between marketing and seduction, right? <laughs> uh, where you have to basically convince enough people who matter to you that you're making something wonderful that they uh, that they should lend their credibility and their money and their time uh, against it, um, and uh, that even applies to when you're just trying to get your friend to help, right? Like it, it's um, it would sort of suck to um, have some fiasco of an idea and then uh, and then convince somebody to waste their time on it, right? So. Uh, um, so it's not all, it's not all, it's not necessarily a waste. Like it can, it can help you um, crystallize and clarify and describe what you're doing um, in a in a way that is actually to the credit of the idea as well. I think I saw a question in the back. Um, yes. Yeah. How, how, how do you think designing art and VR are different? How is VR art unique? Um, so. Uh, Oh, there's a lot of ways. Like one, it's just way less forgiving, right? Like uh, um, stuff that you can keep a better camera control over uh, in uh, in a, a regular flat 2D screen. We got It's kind of like how um, how uh, horseless carriages became cars, and you had to come up with a different word for for carriages. Like the, the so I haven't come up with a good word for a flat old style game that's played on a screen as opposed to a VR game. So I'll just call it flat old style game. Mm -hmm. So like in a flat old style game. Um, <laughs> Uh, you have way more control over the camera, right? And so you can your stuff just needs to look good in this range. Uh, in VR, people stick their noses, you know, into your art and uh, and turn sideways, and so that you, any flaws just become magnified. Even things like proportions, like you can um, you can stuff can look okay and interestingly stylized uh, in a flat old-fashioned screen game, but then when you see it in VR, um, the uh, the forms are, are much more significant. Um, there's performance constraints. You know, you want to hit your 90 frames per second uh, in VR, and so um, either you're going to have a really beefy machine to drive it, or have you considered flat shaded vertex color? You know, like uh, as a as a visual style. Um, uh, human scale for VR. I mean, to the degree that you're doing something that's intended to be seen first person as opposed to like miniature world down on the table. Human scale matters profoundly. Like I, I've been modeling an interior this week 
and um, and uh, in Modo uh, and sort of modeling a chair and it looks fine and then you look at it in VR and you realize it's two feet tall and you're going to scale it up and then you realize that those those legs which you thought were fine on the screen are, are, are the wrong proportions when you see it in VR. So it's 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 less forgiving. Um, uh, performance constraints are more a factor and then depending upon what you're doing in VR, um, telegraphing the affordances, um, telegraphing the like that's a doorknob. It better do something when you grab it and twist it, right? Uh, representing the sort of the functional interactions that your user has in VR, um, without benefit of like mouse over highlights and stuff like that, is uh, um, an art challenge, uh, an art and design challenge, and that the uh, the mechanics need to be expressed uh, in the um, uh, just in world, you know, like uh, as a, uh, as opposed to um, using all the familiar old-fashioned game tropes. Uh, uh, yeah, what are the, the diegetic design is the term, right? For uh, for UI that has to kind of like sit there in the world and be a thing, uh, as opposed to sit there in HUD space. Yeah, we're we're very familiar with that term in class. Yeah. Um, I think the what you're referring to this kind of old uh, 2D style. This uh, I think that the term is non-immersive uh, games that did not provide us with the affordances that VR does. But do you feel that there's any constraints which you're still facing? Is there anything you'd love to do within a game that even with immersive media, you don't have the provided affordances to do? Well, well it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so when I first read about VR in sort of science fiction books, uh, it was always depicted as this sort of like transcendent bodiless experience where you'd sort of float around and do amazing things. Uh, but then you do that in practice, and again, you're going to trip over the dog. Uh, and so um, the... Uh, um, the thing that surprised me about VR is just how embodied you actually are, like how the, your physicality matters tremendously. I mean, we don't, I mean, you've all experienced it, right? Like you translate somebody around in VR and they barf. Um, and, uh, and so I was really, I mean, it's obvious in retrospect, but it surprised the hell out of me at the time that like first person shooters are actually better on a flat screen than they are in VR because you can spin around 180 degrees in a quarter second without throwing up. And, uh, and so I was, I was really shocked at the, um, at the constraints that physical embodiment puts onto VR experiences. Uh, and it made me appreciate, in retrospect, um, the, uh, the disembodied affordances that old-fashioned screen games have. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, that said, the, the, the toolkit is so wonderful now with modern engines, uh, with m modern uh, uh, 3D content creation tools like Maya and Modo. That um, that if you can come up with an idea, you should probably implement it. I mean, you can, there's there's no real good. I haven't come up with things that uh, would be oh so cool to do, but the technology isn't ready. I mean, maybe some AR stuff uh, around um, uh, really seamless tracking of objects in a world and overlaying stuff on them. But I mean, that's starting to get into like um, like rain, Rainbow's End. Uh, do you do you guys you know the book? Uh, sometimes fiction's a good. Um, Kind of intuition pump for uh, for things that you might want to do, and there's this science fiction writer who's um, kind of hit or miss, uh, Werner Vinge, who wrote a book called Rainbow's End that kind of visualized what a world of pervasive augmented reality overlays over everything uh, might be, and how you could uh, how you could navigate that world. Um, and so there's some fantasies around that that are just a decade away, um, but for ordinary kind of VR game stuff and uh, and 3D game stuff. No, I mean, it's, if, if you can think it, if you can think it, and if you can think it coherently without internal contradictions, um, then, which is actually not so easy, um, then, uh, then you should be able to implement it, at least with the help of talented people. Um, the creative director is a really unique and amorphous role within the industry. Um, people come into it from very different kind of roles. I'm interested what your advice would be towards someone, maybe perhaps in our audience uh, or watching online, who's interested in taking on that role. How could someone prepare to become a creative director? Um, so uh, creative director is amorphous enough that you have to define it for yourself as you come into it. Um, and I, I found that, because um, I've worked with other creative directors as well, that the most powerful ones are ones that have uh, a solid grounding in some actual um, skill set that they can bring to bear. So uh, if you kind of like float in on angel dust, Angel dust, no, that's a drug, isn't it? Angel wings, fairy dust. <laughs> if you float in on fairy wings, fairy dust, uh, and you say, I have, uh, I have wonderful ideas, you should all listen to me, um, people are like, get, get out. Um, so basically, the only way that you uh, 
that you can engage a team as a creative director is by providing concrete, clear value. Um, and the only way that you can start by providing concrete, clear value is having some skills, right? Like, I can program, I can write shaders, I can build 3D models, I can prototype for you. Um, and, uh, and so, or I'm, I'm a really good pipeline engineer or whatever. Uh, and so you, uh, you provide um, unambiguous, clear value from where you're standing. Um, and then, um, for me anyway, uh, becoming a creative director was all about um, jumping up. Uh, uh, I mean, part of this was, uh, I'll, I'll speak to my particular case as opposed to general case. So I, I started in um, the industry actually as a senior artist, which is preposterous. But it's because I was coming in with 3D experience when the industry was still all 2D. And so I was able to take a really laughable in retrospect portfolio and leverage it into a, a job as a, a senior artist at Maxis um, because everybody else was doing sprite art in, uh, and deep paint. Um, and, uh, and then I did that for a number of years, became an artist and art director. But then I sort of saw that, um, that, there, um, that, becoming, uh, that, that 3D art and content in general was becoming a little bit, bit um, commodified, that, uh, that, it was, that there were all these wonderful 3D artists that were showing up in Korea, for example. Um, and that you don't really want to be um, competing with them if you can help it. Um, and uh, in, for the last some cities, we worked with huge art houses in China and huge art houses in Russia. Um, and so I kind of sort of sniffed the wind there and said, you know, I should try and figure out how to, um, uh, instead, of, um, instead of making the same sort of art that you're competing with in the commodity world, figure out how you can basically step upstream a little bit and figure out like, what the purpose of some art is, like what, what, what job it's doing. And from there, um, build conceptual pictures for everybody else around um, why you might want one particular art style or another, or what the job, it, what the job that it's doing for, for some particular problem is. So it, it, it's been a, a process of a sort of abstraction and going up level by level by level from um, kind of nuts and bolts to larger and larger, bigger conceptual things, but then using the, um, the nuts and bolts sort of technical skills around making 3D content and writing shaders and, um, and programming to, um, to give those visions concrete form. Uh, and without the concrete form, uh, it's not um, that useful. And do we have another question from the audience? Does your technical team prefer that you're more specific on the vision? Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that like, being a creative director isn't um, uh, kind of a dictatorial, dictatorial role. Uh, you, you have to develop working relationships with everybody on your team individually. Um, some people want really crisp, clear um, direction, like I need this thing to do this. Please make it for me and tell me when you're ready. Uh, and other people want one-on-one uh, -on -one negotiation and collaboration the whole way through. Uh, and so a big chunk of being sort of a career director, in the, at least in my experience, is um, learning how to speak with everybody uh, in their language uh, and developing working relationships. Um, and that actually applies both um, to your teammates, who you're trying to give direction to and help to achieve the vision, and also to the, um, the, your marketing partners and the people who are paying your bills and, and, and so forth. So it's, there's, no, um, there's no sharp answer there. It's, it's, uh, it's all um, relationships and uh, figuring out who needs what and why they, and why they need it. Uh, that said, um, uh, there, are people who, um, uh, there are people who want crisp, unambiguous direction, and they want timelines against it. And then there's people who want to uh, uh, get in the iteration cycle with you and try and figure it out uh, with you, and, and they're both they're both good, you know. It's, it's just relationships. Um, let's say a, a sort of new, uh, or relatively new, um, facet of the games industry has been open development. So um, perhaps you're familiar with uh, Steam, and I believe Google Play also have the open access program, or Steam's former um, green light program, a similar thing. Um, Chris uh, Checker, his um, his Spy Party is being open developed, and then your former work on Atomic Space Command yeah. was also open developed. What was your experience like working on an open developed game where the audience, the uh, patrons, have feedback to give you versus working on a game that was very closed door um, where really the audience didn't know about the game until the trailer released? I think uh, um, part of it's just scale. Like if you're working um, on a big project with a big company and you've got lots of money at stake, then you're probably going to keep it close to the breast until it's time to release because then your marketing department's job is to drum up all the excitement and interest and you don't want to kind of like um, 
you don't want to ruin their reveals and their releases. Um, but by contrast, if there's three of you guys, if there's you know, one or two or three developers all just making something, then um, you've got a, a, a real job to try and get anybody to pay attention to anything that you do, right? Um, and um, the only way that you've got a prayer is by starting at the very beginning as you're starting your project and making as much noise about it as you can and trying to get uh, the world to notice. Uh, if you wait until you're done with your project and then you start telling people uh, and you don't have $20 million to spend on ads, um, then no one's going to know anything about what you've done. It's just going to vanish without a trace, right? So um, as, a practical, as a practical matter, um, as an indie developer uh, or small team without, uh, without a whole lot of spend, um, it, you need all the time you can get to, uh, to convince people, to convince the world to pay attention to you. Um, so it's not, it's not, unless you're independently wealthy, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not uh, an option. You, you have to do open development of some, sort, some form or another. Otherwise, um, you're, uh, you're not going to have nine months or a year or two years to, to tell the world what you're doing. It's going to be two months, and that's just not enough. That's, that's very interesting. So you lean on, on kind of an unequivocal advocacy of open development. Would you say that there's any cases where um, maybe you might regret open development? or? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying open development's a good thing. I'm saying it's mandatory. Um, it's mandatory, I see. <laughs> um, I, I actually think it's a distraction. Uh, I, I mean, at big companies, you have um, community managers, and you have people whose job it is to uh, interact with, uh, um, with your fan base and... All, uh, and that's, a, that's like somebody's job. It's a real job. Um, it takes time and emotional effort and uh, attention. Uh, and uh, some, a lot of developers are kind of, are kind of introverts. They don't need, they're not even good at that kind of stuff, right? Um, so, uh, so the time that you're spending um, on Twitter promoting your stuff or the time you're at uh, Day of the Devs uh, showing off your stuff or whatever, that's time you're not working on your game, right? It's time that you're not making the game better. Um, so it's, uh, it definitely comes at uh, a cost, um, but it's mandatory. It doesn't, it's, unless you've got somebody else doing that for you, then you've got to do it. Uh, so it's not, it's not as if um, you have a choice in the matter, um, even though um, it's definitely a, a suck from other stuff that's probably more valuable that you could be doing if somebody else is going to market your game for you. Hmm. Sorry for the cynical answer. No, it's, it's <laughs> interesting. Um, do we have a question from the student? Yes. Did you ever not agree with the game design you were working on? Um, yes. Uh, I, the, one of the last projects that I worked on at EA uh, before coming to work at Facebook was a, a game where um, the uh, executive leadership on the team, uh, which is to say like a level higher than me as a creative director, um, couldn't figure out what they wanted. Uh, like they, they thought, you know, Minecraft's huge. Mine, we want to do Minecraft. And then, uh, and then, no, we don't want to do Minecraft. And so you, if you have like a... Uh, a shifting variable set of asks that uh, basically if the people who are paying your bills can't figure out what they want and they change their mind every month, then, uh, then you just can't build anything against that, right? And so um, at that point, uh, I uh, say, well, I'll, um, I'll treat it essentially like a bunch of design exercises. You know, I, I, I'll recognize that the, the, the environment that I'm in isn't going to let me actually ship anything cool here, um, but let's say, let's do a a two-week game jam on this idea. Cool. Okay, let's do a two-week game jam on that idea. Cool. Let's do a two-week game jam on that idea. Cool. And that was actually pretty fun. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's just uh, you had to get over the sort of emotional trauma of realizing that they're really all just game jams, right? They're not, you're not, none of this stuff is actually going to go all the way into production. Um, and um, game jams, two-week game jams, um, can be a, a rockin' place to... Uh, um, to uh, bone up on your skills, you know, like the, if, you, if there's something you don't know how to do uh, and you kind of want to know how to do it and EA will pay you <laughs> to learn to do, go do it, you know, like there's no, no complaints. But that was, uh, that was ultimately not sustainable for me, so I, uh, when EA's management kind of went on one of those cycles for a while, I'm like, you know, Facebook sounds pretty good. Um, there's a lot of uh, students in, uh, in both of our classes who might be interested in pursuing a career in game development. Um, and one of the things we're pushing for in 146 is creating games and, and starting to build that portfolio. What advice would you have to someone who's interested in taking a career within the industry um, and is trying to work on developing their reel or portfolio? Um, so uh, I can mostly speak to the, um, the visual art and the technical art side of it, because those are the people that I hired uh, and worked with. Uh, and for those 
those people, it's, it's really um, your, your, your concrete projects that matter. You know, like uh, you're, you're judged on the basis of, um, in the case of artists, you're judged on the case of your portfolio, and then have you actually gotten anything into an engine and done things with it? Um, and then secondarily, um, uh, did it ship? Were you able to get something actually out the door? Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's, I've actually written about this a little bit um, in, on my blog, but the, uh, the, the only thing that really matters is how wonderful is the work you can do. Um, you need to spend some time making sure that your wonderful work is exposed so that people can see it and it's represented in a way that people can appreciate the wonderfulness of it. But if the work isn't wonderful, then, um, then it's hard to get a job unless your uncle works in the industry already or something like that. Um, so uh, visual portfolio, winnow out the, if, <laughs> I don't know how many of you are visual, visual artists, but for visual portfolios, um, you're judged by your worst piece pretty much. You know, So if you have like 20 pieces in there and, uh, and like 18 of them are really great and two of them are crap, uh, an art director is gonna go, he's probably gonna give me the crap one. You know? uh, so you wanna, you wanna make sure you have enough pieces, a dozen pieces, two dozen pieces where it's obvious that you can do stuff, but you really wanna be careful about the lowest quality stuff because that's the, um, uh, that's, um, you're, like I said, you're, most art directors are afraid of getting burned, right? And you're afraid that you're gonna get the, 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 lousy, the lousy stuff. Um, but there's really no, there's no magic answer short of having a kick-ass portfolio. Uh, and kick us portfolio in whatever domain. Uh, if you uh, um, uh, if you are a rigger or a modeler, or if you are if you write chaters or whatever whatever it might be. All right, uh, I think we have room for one or more questions, one or two more questions, perhaps. Um, you know, I, I think in many ways the industry, uh, the, the games industry, um, can seem a little bit like uh, closed off to people not within it. I'm interested. What did you need to take a job within the game industry for in order to learn so certain things? So perhaps I could rephrase that. Um, what could you only learn from having had worked within the industry? So the main thing, so a, a lot of the, um, the technical stuff, you can actually learn pretty well now. Uh, like you can take online courses and become pretty good at writing shaders. You can watch YouTube videos and just practice a lot and become a pretty good 3D modeler. Uh, you can even um, do workshops and become a decent animator. The, the thing that, uh, working uh, in a team in the game industry teaches you is how to work in a team in the game industry, um, which is not nothing. Um, the, uh, the collaborating with other people, bringing out the best in other people, uh, figuring out uh, what your strengths are in relation to the people around you, like those are all um, kind of soft skills by contrast with like writing uh, sort of tight uh, pathfinding loops, for example. Um, but, uh, but those are the things that um, that working in a team gets you. Uh, there's other stuff along those lines, like uh, figuring out how to um, convince other people that uh, the idea that you have is the best one, or if the idea that you have isn't the best one, figuring out how to integrate the stuff from the better idea into your idea. Um, so it's all, it's all kind of um, softer human development skills. Mm -hmm. um, the hard skills you can pick up in school and you can pick up on your own. Yeah, teamwork is such an interesting facet because um, really no, no game is made by one person. Um, thank you so much yeah. for joining us today.